Well, hello and welcome to Summit. Thanks so much for joining us in worship today. It is such a treat to be with you. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is OJ. I'm the campus pastor at our Lake Mary campus. And man, it is just great to be together on the 4th of July. Happy 4th of July to all of you. Um, to my Lake Mary family, if I haven't seen you in person yet, I, I would love to. We, we miss you. It's just been so fun to be back in worship in all the different ways here online, in person, or different campuses. There's just so much happening in the life of our church, and you're invited into all of it. And if you are, are new or visiting, an extra special greeting to you. We are super glad you're here. And in fact, we, we would actually really like to get connected with you. If you check the link below, if you're on the web page, it's kind of below the video. If you're on YouTube, it's in the description. You can click Get Connected and we'll be in touch with you. We'd just love to touch base and kind of get to know you a little bit. Say hi. It'd be such a, a great way to do that today. Um, but for all of you, I wanted to let you know a couple of things that are coming up in the life of the church that I think are really important. The first is this. Hey, if you're in high school, first, super glad that you're here worshiping with us. We have something for you. Edge Serves is coming up really soon. It's July 6th through 8th, and this is an awesome way to serve, to be a part of what God is doing in our community, to use your hands and your feet and your time, if you've got some on you, to go out and make a difference in the world. You'll get some community service hours. You'll find some amazing organizations that are doing really incredible God-honoring work here in our local community, and you'll find out why we serve, what God thinks about all of it, and you'll get connected with other high schoolers in the area too. Uh, you can find out more information. You can uh, find, click the link to register. Um, if, if finances are a hurdle at all, please let us know. We would love to make that work because we really want to get you connected with this. This is such an amazing week and our EDGE team has put together some really awesome stuff. So check it out. And if you're in middle school and you're hearing this, guess what? Surge Serves is coming up later in the month. So just hold on tight. All of it's coming. Sign up soon. We'd love to get you invited to all of that. Uh, speaking of students and kids, this is for you parents. Uh, we actually have a speaker series coming up for you called Parent to Parent. And this is going to be a chance to get together with other parents that are going through this together and to hear some great uh, insight and wisdom about all the seasons of life, the good, the hard, the challenging, everything in between. We have some great panelists that are going to be on there, and I'm really looking forward to it because I am in the thick of this with you. We've got three different weeks of content that are going to be there based on different kind of ages and stages of parenting because it looks different as we move through all of it. It's starting on July 13th. It's going to run three weeks, the 20th and the 27th. It's gonna be happening live at 6.30 p.m. at our Herndon campus, but it's also gonna be available on our YouTube channel. So you're invited in. I'll be there uh, tuning in, watching this, because I'm really looking forward to gaining some wisdom from some of the parents that are around here and just know that we're all in the same boat together. You're invited, join in for that. So we're gonna continue with our worship in a couple of different ways. Today, we're gonna to continue by the singing of songs and hymns of God with their band. We're also gonna continue with their teaching. Uh, this year as a church, we've been looking at the book of Acts and remembering and rethinking and rediscovering how to be the church. And as we've gone along the way, we're looking at some of the letters to the early churches as they're new and, and, and developing. And today we come to 1 Corinthians. As Paul writes this letter to Corinth, to the, the, to the distracted church, to this church that is getting caught up in a lot of the rules and trappings of what's going on, he wants to remind them of what is so important. And though this was written 2,000 years ago, it is so important to us today. There's so much for us to glean. And I'm so glad that Kaylee is bringing you this. As a bit of a disclaimer, today we're going to be covering some really mature themes that are in the midst of it. And this is a very important sermon. There's so much that is in here. But we're going to be talking about sexual immorality and the brokenness and the ripple effects of sin that are in the midst of that. So if you're a parent and you're hearing that and you're like, oh, my kids aren't quite ready for that, maybe this is a good time to go get Right Now Media on or play Bluey. It's a great show uh, to do that and kind of set them up well. But we would love to invite you back. So maybe this is time to hit pause. Join us in a minute. This is going to be a great time together. We're also going to continue with our worship today by the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And if you're new or visiting again, we're super excited that you're here. We'd love to get connected with you, but please uh, don't feel any obligation to give. But if you're a partner here at Summit, if you're a follower of Jesus, there's a good chance you know why we give. We give out of obedience to Scripture and we give because God has entrusted his resources to us. We have an opportunity to leverage those for his work here at our church in our local community and around the world, and your giving matters. It matters deeply. Uh, God keeps inviting us into some amazing things, and you provide for that. So thanks for your generosity. Uh, thanks for your faithfulness. There's a number of different ways you can give. There'll be a number populated on your screen. The text to give as well is linked below. So thank you for that. But however you find yourself worshiping today, thank you. We're so glad to be here. Let's continue to worship Jesus, who adopts us as his children, and provides salvation for each and every one of us. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his 
Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Jesus, thank you for today. Thanks for the opportunity to bring the church into each of these rooms that we find ourselves. Lord, I pray that you would be near to all of us today as we look into your word and allow it to transform us, allow it to shape the way that we look at ourselves and other people. Lord, I pray that you would allow your word to penetrate our hearts so that we would have integrity in the ways that we interact with other people, in the ways that we treat people, even the people that we find it hard to love. And Lord, I pray that you would allow your word to transform the feelings that we have of inadequacy. Lord, you have paid for these bodies with your blood and they are yours and you will and continue to make them glorious. And so Lord, we pray that you would let that truth penetrate our hearts and that we wouldn't undervalue our body nor would we overvalue it, Lord, but always seek to do what would bring honor to you in the way that we treat ourselves individually and in the way that we come together as your body of Christ. So Lord, I pray that you would take your word and that you would allow it to make us more into the people, more into the body that you have created us to be. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, in whom we put our hope. Amen. As we continue in our year through the book of Acts, we've stopped for this interlude in the book of 1 Corinthians, a letter uh, that Paul writes to a church that he planted in Corinth. And uh, after he moves on, he gets some alarming reports about their behavior. And so he writes them to clear up some issues. And this is the letter that we know as the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, and in this interlude, we have discussed kind of the key five themes that Paul hits in this letter, which include divisions in the church, sex, food, worship, and resurrection. So last week, we talked about divisions. We talked about how the church, the, these wisdom worshiping Corinthians, had made a popularity contest out of preaching and they pitted Paul against Apollos and, and, and Peter, even though all three of them were preaching the same message of unity within the body of Christ. And we talked about how we have this lens through which we view the world and our relationships and how once we become followers of Jesus, that lens should be shaped by the values of the gospel, which sacrifice our personal preferences for the sake of unity within the body. So here today in chapters five, six, seven, uh, he gives a lot of instruction on sex, on marriage, on singleness, on lawsuits, which he plops down right in the middle of all the sex talk for some reason. But the overarching message is the same one that we heard last week, which is this, how we treat our body matters. Have you ever mistreated your body before? I feel like my husband mistreats his body constantly. Um, he, but he's also just this really strong, enormous man. And so uh, he seems to do better with, like it, our whole family could have the flu and his body just kind of metabolizes it. Like his body takes the flu and crushes it. Um, and it's just always, life's always been like that for him. And so he constantly subjects himself to things that I think would injure normal people. Like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna eat this whole pizza and go to CrossFit, uh, which is a terrible idea. But, but the reality is, is that we're, we're coming up on 40 here, him this year, me next year. And there are consequences to mistreating our body that are starting to become more frequent. And the truth is he can't mistreat his body like that without at least occasionally suffering the consequences. I remember at the very beginning of the pandemic, this was when you would see kind of supermarket shelves clearing out. We started to panic buy stuff like a lot of people did, like beans and pasta and whatnot. Um, and, and I purchased some baking stuff because I really, uh, I like to stress bake. And so I bought those things. But since everyone was panic buying, there was only, the only frosting that was available was this bright blue royal frosting. And so I got a few cans of that stored in the pantry. And then probably, I don't know, maybe three weeks into the pandemic, we had had just a terrible day. It was, you know, meltdown after meltdown with our daughter who did not understand why she couldn't go and see her friends. And, and we were both trying to juggle our full-time jobs while also facilitating six and a half hours of first grade launch ed every day. And it was just really hard. And, um, and I think also the reality just started to set in that this is not a hiccup. And this was, this is, we're in this for the long haul, the whole world is. And so it was just such a bad day and, and I didn't even have enough energy to stress bake. And so Rob and I take out two cans of this Royal Blue frosting and just start eating it out like, like it's a pint of ice cream. And so we get, you know, three or four spoonfuls deep because it's very rich and then, you know, put it back in the pantry. 
But, uh, but that night after I went to bed, Rob went back and he finished his. And, uh, and it turns out that no human body can eat a full tub of, of bright blue royal frosting without suffering at least some consequences. I woke up the next morning, Rob's in bed writhing, and I walk into the bathroom and it appeared as though someone had murdered a Smurf and then tried to flush its body down my toilet because blue frosting looks the same coming out as it does going in. So how we treat our body matters. How we treat our individual bodies matters, which we're gonna get into today, but also how we treat the body of Christ matters just as much. Remember, we are the church, big C church, all of us here and at the Kingdom Church and at H2O and First Pres and all, we're all the church. We are all part of this one body and, and you're a part of the church. You're an arm or a leg or, or an eye or a, a kidney. Uh, nobody's an appendix because they truly are useless, but we are all members of this body and we all have a function and how we treat that body matters. And Paul says to the Corinthians, the way that you're treating your bodies is all wrong, both individually and corporately. Chapter five, he addresses this man who's sleeping with his stepmom. And the church is apparently proud of it because they are living in their freedom in Christ. You know, we're all covered in the blood, so I'm free to do whatever I wanna do because Jesus forgives me. And Paul says, no, no, no. Are you gonna kick that guy out of the church because he's damaging the body? Chapter six, he talks about lawsuits, Christians taking each other to court. and. At this time, historically, this is far more likely to have been wealthy Christians taking poor Christians to court to take away their tiny little strip of land where they're raising their chickens or whatever. And, uh, and Paul says, no, no, that's greedy. You guys are just as bad as the stepmom guy. Guess up damaging the body. Chapter seven, this is a little confusing. He starts out by telling married people that it's okay to have sex with their own wives. Uh, remember, we only have Paul's answers, we don't have the questions. Um, so, you know, you can imagine what they may have asked. Remember the Corinthians, they were steeped in this kind of stoic, cynic philosophy. And, and the Stoics, they had a slogan, which was, I can do whatever I want. And, 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 and the body and the soul are completely different stuff. They're completely different forms of matter. This is a dualism that says what I do with my physical body doesn't matter because the body is just this base kind of physical husk that I'm gonna shed when I die and I go to heaven. So nothing I do with my physical body will affect my spiritual soul. And so some of them have apparently go, gone so far as to say, you know what, I don't even think that we should uh, be having sex with our own wives and husbands because that's just this kind of base physical thing and instead, you know, we should devote ourselves to, to seeking wisdom together. And Paul's like, are, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, I, you, you, so you're telling me that you wanna stop having sex with your own wives so that you can seek enlightenment or whatever, but then you are stepping out to see the temple prostitutes on the weekends because of all your pent up sexual frustration that you only have because you are seeking enlightenment with your wife instead. He's like, no, no, that's, that's silly. You're, you're, you know, you're trying to be intellectually and spiritually superior by doing these things, but it's, it's hurting you. It's hurting your family, it's hurting your wife, it's hurting, it's doing damage to the body. And parenthetically, and this isn't part of the main, uh, point of the message, but I do think it's important and I wanna stop here for a second. Paul goes on to, to say basically like, if, if you wanna seek that level of enlightenment with God, then just don't get married. Just don't get married. He says, you know, it's great if you wanna get married, it's not a sin, but here in verse 32, I would like for you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord but a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. You bet your Torah he is. And it's the same for women, right? You know, an unmarried woman is devoted to the Lord in body and soul, but, but a, a married woman is concerned about how, ple how to please her husband. Verse seven, or chapter seven, verse seven. I wish that all men were as I am. He means unmarried there. But each man has his own gift. One has this gift, another has that. So, so Paul sees singleness as a gift because it allows for this single-minded devotion to Jesus Christ. And I bring this up because I think that the church has a tendency to make single people feel less than, or like they're in a waiting period or incomplete because they're still unmarried. But, but 
a close reading of chapter 7 will show that, at least in Paul's opinion, the single people are superior <laughs> than all, you know, us married people who had to get married because we can't control our own bodies. So just a thought. Chapters 5, 6, and 7, all of Paul's message is clear and consistent. How we treat our body matters. So stop damaging your body. We look at relationships through a very wrong lens a lot of the times. So, you know, we'll look at a relationship through the lens of, of how, can, how can I get what I want, but still meet just the bare minimum standard of what God has asked for me to do in relationships. But we cannot look at relationships through that lens and, not, and reasonably expect to not do damage to our body. I mean, that's crazy, right? We should, we should always be looking through the lens of the gospel, which again, sacrifices my personal preference, my personal desires for the sake of the good of the body. And so today we're gonna to be exploring what Paul has to say about sex, some practices in particular which are causing damage to the body of Christ at Corinth, um, both to their individual bodies and to the body as a corporate whole. So you can look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and stomach for, the, for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from, from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of the body of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that, you, that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own, you are bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So again, about all of these issues, incest, prostitutes, lawsuits, Paul has this to say, stop damaging the body. And now the Corinthians know, you know, as, as Paul has taught them to know, that Jesus' blood covers every sin. They are free in Christ truly as is anyone who calls him Lord. They know this. Sometimes we call this Christian liberty, right? I'm not constrained by legalism. I can go out, I can have a beer, I can say a curse word, I can you know, watch a movie with a sex scene in it and nobody's losing their salvation. No, I'm not advocating those things. I'm just saying this, this is how the argument goes, Christian liberty. But, but the Corinthians are viewing Christian liberty through their cynic Stoic philosophy. Remember the Stoics, they had that slogan, I'm free from anything. The enlightened one, the Sophoi, is so superior that he has no outward constraints anymore. He's free to do whatever he wants in the understanding that there are no things that constrain him. And this is the worldview that they had when they first learned the truth about Jesus Christ. And so of course, when they're looking at Christian liberty, through that cultural lens, of course what they're gonna end up with is a saying like, I'm free to do whatever I want. But Paul's saying, no, 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 free, freedom in Christ is not freedom to do whatever you want. It's, it's freedom from punishment, yes. Jesus has paid your eternal debt of sin to God. It is debt forgiveness. In Christ, we, are, we have freedom from our eternal debt to God. We do not, however, have freedom from the temporal consequences, the short-term consequences, the earthly consequences of our choices. Yes, you are free from being held accountable for your eternal debt, but no, you are not free from the consequences of sin. What you do with your body has consequences. That's what Paul's saying. Jesus doesn't take those away just because he takes away your eternal guilt. Does that make sense? What we do with our body matters. Remember, Paul, he just keeps coming back to this theme over and over again in this letter. What we do with our body, build up the body of Christ. Build it up. Don't tear it down. We get all mixed up in church sometimes, just like the Corinthians did, because we take our cultural norms, our cultural lens, and we view our freedom in Christ through that lens, and, and we mash them up together, and then what we're, what we end up with something that isn't true. You know, we, 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 our lens, though, isn't stoicism, right? Our lens is hedonism. 
I should be free to pursue pleasure and happiness through any means necessary. And that is my fundamental right. Anything that stands between me and pursuing pleasure and happiness is, a, is an unreasonably controlling thing and maybe it's downright abusive. Guys, that's not in the Bible. I mean, it doesn't say that in the Bible. Like every civilization, our expectations are bent by the culture that we are immersed in. And our cultural narrative is that we should be free uh, and, 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 and we are entitled to have all of our needs met. We are entitled to be happy and safe so much so we, we think that so deeply that the thought of enduring anything hard, if, especially for a long period of time, seems like a sin against us. And it would be naive to believe that that cultural lens has not affected our faith. It absolutely has. It, it breeds in us the same thing it did to the Corinthians, this, this syncretism, this you know, idea that, that we combine all the good parts about Jesus, the love, the grace, the salvation, and then we mash that up with our cultural lens, which is that we are entitled to be happy and safe and rich. I mean, someone show me where Jesus says that. He didn't say it. Paul is far more concerned with the health of the church than he is about me being particularly happy in it. He's far more concerned about how I serve the church than how the church serves me. He's far more concerned about the health of the body of Christ together than he is about me in particular alone. Why is that? I think, I think we really need to understand this why that is, if we have any hope of, of changing our lens, of getting rid of that bad old lens and, and, and having our lens shaped by the gospel. So we're going to take a little detour back to the beginning of created history uh, because we have to understand, we, we have to understand that there is a point to all this stuff that we call church. There's a point to it. We're, this, isn't, this isn't just my hobby. You know, if it, it, I believe this stuff. If I didn't, I would find something easier to do for a living, I, like hair. I love doing hair. And you know what? No one ever emails me after I do their hair to you know, correct my pronunciation of Hebrew names or something. I could do hair, but I really believe this. I believe that this book has the words of life and there's a point to doing that, this thing that we call church. And that point was established at the very beginning of created history. So we're gonna take a look there because it's still true for us today. So in the beginning, God created Adam and Eve and put them in the beautiful creation. And there was just this one rule. Don't eat from this tree, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You have one job, right? But then the devil tempts them and they, and they do that one thing. And through their sin, suffering and death, enter into the good creation. And then more and more people are born, but they just, they keep hurting each other. And, and hurting God because they keep doing different versions of this one thing. And so to rescue his people, God chooses Israel to lead them home by acting as an example. Not because Israel is particularly good, but he, but he picked them and said, You're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my covenant with you guys. And I'm going to use you to show the world that living in covenant community with me leads to blessedness. And he gave them rules. And he said, if you just follow these rules, if you'll just do these things then you're gonna be beautiful and people are gonna look at you and they're gonna to wanna to know the God that you live that way for. They're gonna to wanna to be a part of this community. That was the mission of God's people, to live lives that are so magnetic, so attractive to the outside world that other people wanna know the God that you live that way for. That was their mission and that Summit Church is our mission. It was passed on to us, the church, the body of Christ. We are supposed to live together, you and I and the people that you don't like that live down the street. We're all supposed to live together and love one another in such a way that it makes other people want to be a part of this community. Does the way that you treat other Christians, does, do you think that makes people want to be a part of this community? Because that's the point. That is the reason that Paul cares so much about how we treat one another because we are supposed to be beautiful. We are supposed to be something that attracts other people, but the whole point of doing church is to convince people to show them that life with Jesus is better than life without him. And we can't do that if we hate and if we judge and if we're petty and we put our own preferences first. We can't do our job if we do damage to the body of Christ in the way that we treat one another. And so when I talk to you about sexual integrity, I'm not being old fashioned. I'm not saying, you know, don't do it because the Bible says so. I'm saying don't do it because it does damage to this body and then the body can't do its job. We can't be beautiful to the world. 
because nothing annihilates the bonds between human beings like a little girl who was molested by her uncle. Nothing destroys families and rips them apart like a spouse who cheats and then leaves his, their kids to figure out what they did wrong. Nothing does damage to the heart quite like giving your body vulnerably, trustingly to someone who you really want only to find out a month later that they don't want you anymore. All sin does damage to the body, but sexual sin, it can break our most important bonds and it can forge bonds where there should not be. In 1889, there was, a, there was a small soap company in the city of Freiburg, Germany, and they were working with this chemical substance that they were using to make their soap, um, and the, the substance was called trithioacetone. It occurs naturally in roast beef. It's a fragrance, a, a flavoring. And the chemists at Whitehall Soap Company were attempting to chemically crack the trithioacetone into one of its component parts. They wanted to break a bond to make it into this other molecule called thioacetone, which they were gonna use to make their soap. But when they succeeded, when they cracked this single molecule, the aroma that was produced in this uh, chemical process was described as, uh, in, in a scientific journal, by the way, as the stench of hell's dumpster. <laughs> and, and people, workers in buildings quarter mile away started fainting because of the smell. The, the breaking of this one bond resulted in the evacuation of the city of Freiburg because they thought that the smell was lethal. The ethics of the Ten Commandments, you know, maybe they sound old fashioned, but th there's a point to them. They are forming this beautiful molecule that people can look at and say, I want that in my life. I want, that's a fragrance to me. I want that in my life. And the relational bonds within that molecule, friends, parents, kids, lovers, neighbors, they all bond together to form something strong and beautiful, this fragrance. And that is why, that is why Paul is so obsessed with these bonds not being broken. That's why he's so obsessed with not damaging them because to break a single one of those bonds can take us from a fragrance to a stench. They can take us from being a pleasing aroma that invites people nearer to Jesus and it can turn us into a noxious gas that drives people away. That's, that's what Paul's getting at here. So he's saying, you know, he's, he's throwing their Corinthian wisdom back at them. He's, he's taking that Corinthian wisdom that says, what I do with my body doesn't, add, doesn't matter. And he's saying, doesn't matter for whom? Doesn't matter for whom, Paul would ask. Because it matters for your wife, who's at home in tears because you just found out. It matters to those women who are trafficked to make, you know, those videos that you watch behind closed doors. It matters to your daughter who throws up her dinner because she's learning from you that only skinny girls are beautiful. I mean, can you visit a prostitute and still be a Christian? Sure, but, but, but if you do that, you damage the body and you make us a stench. And we can't do our job, none of us. Look at your freedom through the lens of the gospel and then you will stop asking the question, what's permitted for my body? And you will start asking the question, what's good for my body? Because the two are very different. One of them is a salad and another one is a can of blue frosting. And then Paul, in characteristic fashion of 1 Corinthians, kind of drives it home here at the end of chapter 6 and says, you know what? If all of this doesn't matter to you, if none of my appeals uh, matter, if, if it's all fallen on deaf ears, um, you don't want to take responsibility for other people in the body of Christ. Uh, you know, you don't care about building up the body and, and you are insistent that you are only responsible for your body and not this body. Then allow me to remind you that your body doesn't even belong to you anymore. 1 Corinthians 6, chapter, chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. My daughter, uh, Amber, just turned seven and she, she can get a little lippy these days. It's my fault. I let her watch too much of The Bachelorette. I don't do that. Some of you believed me and I'm insulted that you did. She didn't watch The Bachelorette. 
she watches Stranger Things with me and her dad. It's way more age appropriate. <laughs> but she's getting a little lippy because, uh, you know, she imitates the things that she sees on TV or other kids that she meets at school. Um, and, and most recently, we're in the living room and Rob yelled up that she had to clean her room and she pops her sweet little seven-year-old head out of that door and says, not happening. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and so we had to go upstairs and clarify some things about our arrangement as her parents. And so I got in there and I said, Ember, um, is, uh, is that your bed? And she said, yeah. And I said, so you, you paid for that bed? And she said, no. And I said, who, who do you think paid for that bed? And she said, daddy. Also, she thinks I'm a volunteer here at the church, which is just, that's neither here nor there. But yes, so, so daddy paid for that bed. So that's daddy's bed, right? She's like, okay, yeah. And so then I say, are, are those your Legos on the floor there? And I can see the wheels turning. And a moment ago, she wanted to say, yes, those are my Legos. But now she's like, I see where you're going with this mother and I'm a wiser child now. And those are in fact, not my Legos. So she, she looks at me and goes, are they daddy's Legos? And I said, yes, those are daddy's, daddy paid for those Legos. Those are daddy's Legos. And I can see that she's starting to put things together. And, 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 and so we start pointing out other things in the room. You know, is that yours? Is that, and, and yep, daddy paid for them. Those are, that's daddy's stuff. In fact, this is daddy's room. You are just living in it. And, and so if, if that's daddy's bed and those are daddy's Legos and that's daddy's rug and those are daddy's dresses in the closet, which I said mostly to just amuse myself, then, then what do you think that we should do when daddy says to clean up your room? And she looks and goes, let daddy clean it up because it's his stuff. And I was like, no, okay, I see, I see how you got there. I see how you got there with that one. But no, no, the point is that we should take good care of that stuff because it's not our stuff. That's daddy's stuff. He's, he's just letting you use it, so you should take care of it. You see where I'm going with this, right? That, that room was bought with a price. It's not her room. If you rent an apartment, you can't just knock down walls because those aren't your walls. Those walls were bought with a price. They don't belong to you. Your, your body was bought with a price. You were bought with a price. That's not your body anymore. That body was paid for by the blood in Jesus's veins. That is not your body. It's God's body. You're just living in it. And so verse 20, therefore honor God with your body. There's a lot more in chapters five, six, and seven. We didn't even touch the lawsuit stuff, but, but, but all of it, again, all of it comes back to this theme that Paul repeats over and over that we should build up the body of Christ. Everything we do should be to build up and not to tear down, which means we have to look at every relationship through that lens of the gospel, that, that even though we have liberty, we have freedom, we should never use it at the expense of love. Yes, you are free, but don't value freedom over love. Yes, I'm free, but if my freedom hurts you, then it hurts me too. Because we are part of one body, one body, the same body. And that, that body was bought with a price, a price so costly that I could never repay it. We could never repay it. But church, we gotta get better at at least paying it forward. We're gonna end our service here with some worship, but first it seemed fitting that as we celebrate our freedom today on July 4th, that we take a moment, we took this moment to reflect on how Jesus would have us use that freedom, on how we can use our freedom to build up and in, in love and service to one another. And so we're gonna take a minute and we're gonna pray for our world together. I'm gonna give you some prompts. Um, we're gonna pray for our world, for the body of Christ all together uh, and, and you, I'll give the prompts and then you can pray silently and then I'll close us. So would you bow your heads and pray with me? Jesus, thank you for the freedom that you have given us through your blood. And I pray that you would help us to mature in you, that we would make you proud with the way that we use the freedom and the liberty that you've offered. And so, Lord, we lift up to you our world, our entire world, the world leaders in it, the political leaders. Lord, we lift up to you the scientists, the people who are working on cures, the people who are working on the pandemic. We lift up to you everyone who is suffering and who has lost people as a result of this illness. So, Lord, we take these next few moments and we ask that you would be present and working in our world.
Lord, we lift up to you our country. We lift up to you our country's leaders. We lift up to you everything that happens as a result of their leadership. We lift up to you the way people live together. We lift up to you our neighbors. We pray that you would show us how to use our freedom in service of them. Lord, we ask for your blessing on everyone who's given their lives in service of freedom. We ask for you to be a special comfort for them today. Lord, we lift up to you, Florida, our state. We lift up to you the people who have been touched by so much tragedy, everything from, falls, from Pulse to the, to the collapse of the condo. Lord, we ask that you would be present and working in the lives of the survivors and their families, that you would be near to them. Lord, we lift up to you our church, this body of Christ and the body of Christ at large. We pray that you would form us more in your image so that we would understand our freedom in you, but that we would also use it well. And so, Lord, we lift up to you our hearts, and we ask that you would move in us to value love over freedom and to use our freedom in service of others. So, Lord, we pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we have our freedom. Amen. Before you sat down at God's great right hand, Lifted up just outside the promised land And the one who saw the day that time began Became the venom's cure You became the son of man So we fix our eyes on you We fix our eyes on you For the joy set before you, you came to our rescue, and for silver you were sold. Now the thieves get heaven's gold. He who finds life will lose it, but in losing we're finding out there's joy waiting for us. You set joy before us. Garden as you pray, and the one.
joy sent before you You came to our rescue And for silver you were sold Now the thieves get to heaven's gold He who finds life will lose it But in losing we're finding out There's joy waiting for us Cause you endured the cross For the joy set before you You came to our rescue And for silver you were sold Now the thieves get heaven's gold He who finds a life will lose it But in losing we're finding out There's joy waiting for us You set joy before us Thank you, band, and thank you, Kaylee. Um, Paul reminds the early church that we are giving so much freedom in Christ, yet we have this huge responsibility to use our lives in the service of others and for the sake of others. And he reminds us today, 2,000 years later, that it is so true. The ripple effects of what we do for good can change lives for generations, but also the ripple effects of sin can be so devastating. And I'm so thankful that we've had the opportunity to remember that today. And to be reminded on this day where we're celebrating the freedom of our country, what we can do the freedom in Christ in our lives and for the sake of others. If we can be praying for you, please click the link below. We would love to be in prayer with you and for you throughout the week. But as we conclude this service, hear these words of benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in God's peace. This service has ended.